All right, it's 1 p.m., so we'll get started. My name is Carl Wiedemann. This is Markup Ain't Easy, how I, and hopefully you, will love a object-oriented render API. This is a very kind of future-looking talk about what I think we would like to do or what I would like to see in core in the future. Um, and there's gonna be some demo, there's gonna be some code, there's a few proofs of concept, and hopefully um, we can get people excited about this and hopefully start discussing it more. So, um, oh, my slide telling me who I am is gone. Well, I'm Carl, I'm C4RL on Drupal.org. Uh, I'm a developer, themer, and trainer, and I was giving a training once at George Washington University. It was teaching people how to theme in Drupal. This is Drupal 7. This was about three years ago. And I was trying to duplicate a layout that they had. And they had made this layout in static HTML, and they had like a menu that was fixed in, a, in, a, in an area. And they want to know, well, how do, I, how do I theme a menu myself? How do I actually like get the menu and then spit it out in the template. And that example sounds easy. <laughs> it was not easy. It was not easy to do. It was really hard to do. And I could see the faces of the people in the class feeling like theming. This is really hard. This is tough. This is really hard. And really, since that moment, um, theming is hard. Theming in Drupal 7 is much harder than it was in Drupal 6. There's a lot more concepts. Um, things have. Um, Things have not really been getting easier for people. Um, this is a common thing we've talked about a lot. Theming is hard because the render system, which is kind of this larger component that does the theming, is complicated. Um, and this is one of my favorite graphics that perhaps you've seen uh, <laughs> that John Wilkins made of the Drupal 7 theme system. Um, and it's not even well understood by people who work on core. Things are getting better since then. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements. We have this thing called Twig, which is very cool. Uh, everybody's probably at least seen some examples of that and gone to probably some Twig talks. Um, but the rendering hasn't changed very much. Rendering as um, it exists in a function called Drupal Render. And really, the, re the reason this is complicated is because of its implementation. And that implementation isn't very well hidden. Um, what Twig aspires to do are things like this, where we have a variable and we wish to kind of drill into that variable. Um, we have the image, this, this, this would be like a, a node. We have a, an image field on a, um, a content variable. We want to dig into the first image in that variable and then get the source of that, build our own image tag, right? This is what Twig kind of aspires to do, is what we want to do. We actually cannot do this in Drupal 8. Um, because we don't have an API for render arrays. Render arrays are arrays, and arrays don't have an API. They're just sitting there. Um, the real technical reason here is because source is in template preprocess image, which happens after template preprocess node. So the node template, which is where this lives, has no access to that variable because we, render, we want to render these things on the fly. right? We want to lately process them. That's what the render function is which is a good aspiration, but arrays aren't smart. So as much as you want to do this, you're going to get a heinous error, and the things that you thought you might have due to a preprocessor won't exist. So drillability, which is kind of what Twig wants to do, we can't do. We just can't. And this, I've kind of discovered this in the middle of uh, DrupalCon Portland and had this awful kind of sinking feeling that like we had done a lot of work but really hadn't solved a really fundamental problem. So instead of <clears throat> an API, we have Drupal Render, which you might call Array API instead. <laughs> or uh, AP may st might stand for anti-pattern if you want. Um, how does it work? Well, we create a big array of stuff. We eat it up. And then there's a string that just comes from somewhere. And sometimes it's a theme function. Sometimes it's a theme function that's wrapped in something else. Uh, sometimes there's wrappers, there's 
other processors, uh, it's pretty convoluted. It's one of the longest procedural functions in core. Um, it's 185 lines on its own, and now it's the only function that calls theme. Um, and theme is 244 lines. The only functions that are longer than these are things that like return like a list of countries or like a list of MIME types, stuff like that. Um, it's called a lot. Uh, it recurses many, many times. Uh, if you, from an empty cache, single node view with one image field, one taxonomy term, it's called over 200 times um, in one re request. So when you have that many lines of code that are so convoluted, it's hard to follow. This is a quote from someone who works on Core a lot, Jesse Beach, in an issue about render cache. Um, and she was working on this for a while and running into some difficulty and said this, I'm not convinced that this proposed change will give us the performance increase that will justify the complexity we'll have to introduce. And that has kind of been this, this story of Drupal Render for a while, is that every single time we want to put something, a new feature on Drupal Render, that function gets bigger. And we have new properties that go into that array. So while a lot of 8.x is saying arrays are going away, Drupal Render is still using arrays. And you can create as much dependency injection and fanciness and components as you want. And you can have as much fanciness on the theme layer as you would like. Fundamentally, there's this array in between those things that is holding everything together. OK, that's the complaining part of the s session. Um, I don't know if anyone is going to defend arrays outright. I think there's some reasons that we haven't done these changes because it's a lot of work to do. Um, I'm not saying that this is anything that we can do for Drupal 8, so at least not 8.0. Um, so this is maybe Drupal 9. This is kind of what this could look like. A lot of the discussion that we've had about improving the render system, improving the theme system have been like, well, let's introduce another pound property into the render array. and that kind of discussion I find kind of dissuasive because it, it's kind of bolting onto this thing that we've been using a long time that fundamentally has problems. It's just not well designed. Uh, so I'm going to talk conceptually about rendering. I'm going to show some code that I've written. It's a proof of concept. It's not actually in Drupal yet. It's in Silex. It's kind of standing on its own. Um, but I think maybe offers some promise for this. And then we can talk about what would be the next steps. Is this a good idea? Is it not a good idea? Etc. So, conceptually, what is what what is rendering itself? What do we need? I think we need two things. I think we need an abstracted, alterable, consistent model of structured content. Render arrays are these structural things that will be turned into HTML pages. But there's a structure there, um, and it's it's abstracted. It, not necessarily HTML. It could be something else. Um, it could be sent to like Google Glass, and maybe they use something other to, else to render it. It could be sent to some other kind of device. <clears throat> I think we need a sensible, accessible API for this model to get into those things and to pull them out. I think a really good example <clears throat> of something that does this is think about jQuery. How often when you're using jQuery do you like dump the jQuery object to the screen to look around and get inside of it? You don't, because it has methods. It has ways to get at the things you need. Um, render arrays, we have to dump them out. We have to inspect them. We have to dig through them. Uh, as Larry said in his talk this morning, arrays are not APIs. So this is not something new. Um, it's new in the sense of Drupal, the Drupal render world, though. So do we have an API? No, we have arrays. All right, the part we've all been waiting for, objects. Um, this is some code that I've written. It's on GitHub right now. It's not yet um, really part of Drupal yet. I've, I've done some things to, to kind of emulate Drupal. I actually have a file called fake Drupal that pretends it's Drupal and kind of does some things that Drupal does. Um, mostly, this is just a demo. This is just to try to com communicate some of the principles that I think um, could work. Um, and it's, it's at a phase now where I, I would love input from other people and um, maybe getting a proof of concept that would run in, in a, a core sandbox. So I'm just going to show some code uh, and some examples of, of what this would look like. 
Okay. <clears throat> so, um, this is the GitHub project. When you check it out, you get this stuff. Uh, it looks kind of like Drupal. It's not Drupal. In fact, if you go in core, there's something called fake Drupal, which pretends it's Drupal. It kind of does the things that Drupal does in terms of like loading modules and, and stuff like that. Um, the index file is running Silex. Uh, Silex is just basically a route handler. Um, and I've got some stuff in here that I'll, I'll explain. <clears throat> when you load this in a browser, this is just going to so show you some very simple examples of things that I've done um, using the architecture here. So first thing I have is um, a node. All right, so if we open this up and look at the source, this is just a, you know, a very basic template here. Um, if we look in Silex, uh, here's the code for what this returns, if you've used Silex before. Basically, Silex says, at some route, what am I going to do? So <clears throat> what this is doing is it's generating, uh, it's generating something that's called a renderable builder. Um, that takes two arguments. It takes an argument that wants to know what is the renderable um, itself, what's the type of thing that I'm doing. This is similar to like the theme function, or the theme callback. Um, and then it takes an array of arguments. So for example, um, this one is, is something that I'm calling theme node. Um, it's taking node as an, as an argument. Um, this will correspondingly have a, a class that is associated with it and a template that's associated with it. So in my fake Drupal, I've kind of faked out node module. Um, it's not connecting to a database, it's not really doing anything, it's just loading up some, um, you know, a very s simple piece of data. Um, inside of theme, uh, inside of the, the node theme, here's, here's the class that this is going to build. Um, and I'll get to this in a second. But what I want people to see is that <clears throat> this right here, let's see, um, I think render arrays should turn into a builder pattern, for those of you who are familiar with object-oriented design patterns. Uh, builder is similar to a factory. It's something that makes other things. Um, but the actual creation is delegated to a kind of later step. So we're going to kind of build something up and then create that thing. Um, so when we think of renderable arrays, yes, we're kind of building up this big structure, and then we're going to theme that structure. So that seems like a builder to me. Um, that's what this build thing is. This syntax is actually really similar. Like, doesn't this look very similar to like this? Right? It's not that different from what we've seen in Drupal before. The difference is it's returning an object and not a string. Um, so this is going to create a builder. That builder has a class that's associated with it. So here's the theme node class. Um, and right now, it really has just kind of one method that we would concern ourselves with, which is a prepare method. Um, and it's got a, a template name associated with it. And you know, in my, in my fake node module, in my templates director, here's my node.html.twig. This is what we saw in the browser. And so the, the prepare method is basically what uh, template preprocess functions do. Like when you have the, your base template preprocess function, it's going to do some things. Um, and so here, you can see that our node theme extends an abstract renderable. That has getters and setters. That's how we're going to get at variables and set variables. Instead of an array of stuff, we're going to use methods. Methods are useful. Methods give us lots of power. So I pass it a node, and then I'm actually going to set something called title. I'm going to set something called content. In my node theme, I'm going to have title and content. Um, I could do something like Set foo to bar. Oops. Oh no. <laughs> oh, right. I didn't sleep very well last night, so <laughs> I may make some typos. OK, so getters and setters living there. Um, in my fake Drupal, so <clears throat> that's fine for like core um, 
like defining your own theme function. What about themes? Themes override things. We have pre like preprocessors. Modules can preprocess things. Themes can preprocess things. So in my fake Drupal, I have a theme down here called Austin. Um, I also have a module called, I think I put it down in the modules. Right? This is not Drupal. This is fake Drupal, right? I'm just kind of pretending I'm Drupal. Um, I have a module called Colorado. That's where I'm from. And here I have um, two things um, that are going to pre-process things. And you'll see that these are classes. One is called Colorado Full Node Decorator. One is called Austin Full Node Decorator. And this, I believe, is how preprocessor should work, um, <clears throat> is it should move to a decorator pattern. So what happens in conventional Drupal is we have this array of arguments. Then we pass it out to preprocessors. It's sending an array by reference. It's adding things to that array. That's basically a decorator. A uh, decorator pattern is behavior is added to an object dynamically at runtime without affecting other objects of the same class. So um, I, can, I can add things onto my um, renderable um, as I please. So <clears throat> let me actually enable one of my modules. So let me go to my Colorado full node decorator. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, change the title variable. Uh, we could, you know, we could use annotations here to say, like, what is this actually doing? This should actually, I changed the names of these very recently, so this was called theme full node, but um, you get the point. But I could, um, what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I actually want to, I'm going to do the parent prepare, and then I'm going to set the title to this, the title node, and it's going to say from Colorado. So in my fake Drupal, this is how I enable modules. So I uncomment them. So <clears throat> what, what, what is that doing? That is just decorating the um, theme node class. It's simply running the first prepare, then it's running the other prepare as a decorator on the original class. If I enable my um, Austin theme, uh, it also has a node decorator as well. It's actually setting an, an, a new uh, variable there, a subtitle. And it's also providing a new uh, template that is, that is going to um, print out subtitle. So I'll show that in a second. Um, let me show another example. Here's what maybe a, these are some very simple examples to start with. Here's like what an item list looks like, right? Theme item list, provide an array of items as first, second, and third. So if I go to, I, put, I believe just for the sake of demo, I put this in system. Um, here's my theme item list class. It has a template name, has a prepare method. Um, and it's basically like, oh, if you haven't put a type variable, it's going to default the type to UL. Um, so that's basically what theme item list does at this point. And then theme item list in my twig does this kind of thing. This is basically, it's not the exact, you know, it's basically what we're, we're doing now in core. So if I go back to my example, and here's the item list, um, and I could, you know, um, this um, set items, I could change that to something else if I wanted to, using the set parameter. And don't forget your semicolon. Um, builders can have parameters that are other builders. So here's a more um, here's a more complicated example. I'm calling something fancy. Let me go back to what this is. So um, this render API create function can accept an array of builders, or you can accept one builder, or um, or sorry, one. Pr um, it can it can create one builder. It can create an array of of other builders here. So here, what I'm doing is I'm um, like loading up three like an array of th three nodes. This second parameter here is a weight, so I'm adjusting the weight of how these would appear, and I'm putting an item list, and that also has a weight. So the item list has a weight of negative one. Uh, this also has negative one, um, zero, and then three. So we should see the item list first, um, then node one, two, three, then node seven, eight, nine, then node f 
four, five, six. That's what we see here. So I could change these around. I could make this negative two, and it should move to the top. So these can have weights associated with them. Weight is actually a method on a builder. So you can say set the weight to this, et cetera. Here's kind of um, a further example that, that I think will, will show like what a, what a page would look like. So here we say we're going to create a um, theme page. We're going to have an array of these parameters. If I look at like a page.html.twig, here's my page. And then here are the parameters for that page. Um, and in my index.php, you can see that um, I'm loading a node. I have a sidebar that's going to have some nodes in it. Let's actually go ahead and look at this example. Here's a sample page. Oh, well, I have a very small browser. <laughs> oh, it's because <laughs> there we go. OK. Um, so I've got some header value, some sidebar value. It's got some other builders in it. Um, so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> what we can do is because we have getter methods, because these are objects, is we can get to some of those variables that we couldn't get to in Twig. So for example, I'm going to enable my Austin theme. So we'll see what this looks like in the Austin theme. Here's my fake Drupal, how I enable a theme. Here's the Austin theme. So as we dig into the Austin theme, we see that um, Austin full node decorator. Sorry about the size of my screen, folks. Um, we're going to create a new variable called subtitle. It's going to say, here's the subtitle for node. It's going to get the title from the builder itself, not the node. So that means it's, it's going to uh, it's going to say, here's the subtitle for node, node123 from Colorado. That's what the module decorator did. This is another decorator further decorating this renderable. Um, and because we have accessor methods, what we can do is I can go to my um, Austin page template. And say in my header is I can start to do this drilling that we couldn't do before. So let's say I want to say the subtitle of the second node in the sidebar is. That would be basically, you know, I can I can just start to look at what these are. So I can say sidebar first, and I'm just going to print out the nodes. So this is printing out both the nodes. I want maybe the, that would be the first node. There's the second node. Save, refresh, uh, subtitle. Save, refresh. So this is accessing a variable from a parent template that is given by a decorator that exists for a template below it. The reason this works is because Twig's template class can be extended. Uh, in my fake Drupal, I've done a very crude implementation of this. Here's fake Drupal. Abstract fake Drupal twig template.php. That's what it's called right now, but obviously this would be better. There's a function that they have called get attribute. That's what that dot thing is doing in the compiled template. And what I'm doing is if this is um, running a uh, renderable builder interface, it's running a function called find. What find does is it looks for the variable. If it doesn't find it, it creates the renderable. It then looks for the variable in the renderable in the, in, the, um, in the prepared values. So I won't dig too much into the code here of all these you know, um, attributes and classes. What this means is that if, this, if something like this gets into core, um, then this issue is fixed, potentially. So that would be a very nice thing. I think it would be a big win for front-end templating in general. Um, the third principle that I want to uh, communicate here is building and decoration isn't invoked until the builder is cast to a string. Um, so this means that the builder just sits there. It's just sitting there. The moment it's cast to a string, it will then find the child class, build an instance of that, run the prepare methods, then look at the theme engine, and do those kinds of things. That's what it's doing right now. This is a very simple example. It's not you know, fit for Drupal quite yet. Um, but this uses the two-string magic method. And this is another nice thing about uh, objects, is they can be an object until you, you cast them to something. 
in this case, the, the string. Um, this process looks, I'm just going to jump ahead. Uh, I'm just going to run, I'll just, let's just try to get this conceptually, but basically we create the builder. When you run the two string method, it's going to create the renderable itself based on some class name parameter. It's going to decorate that with all your preprocessors, and then it casts that to a string. So it's this kind of two-step process here. Um, I have a few more slides, and then people can ask questions and things like that. But I think this is, this is where I'd really like to see this go. Um, I think there's some challenges here. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely a lot of work to, to do. It's not something I think that we can do for eight. Um, but for nine, I, I, would, I would really like to, to see it. So at this point, this is, this is a core conversation. It's where we chat about things. Um, I can show more examples of this. Oh, I remember one thing I forgot to show. Let me, let me actually show one, one more thing, and then, then we'll, we'll chat. Um, so I was giving this talk, a version of this talk in, in Prague. And um, I think it was Jesse Beach who asked, so if we have an API for structure, can that API be presented as a REST endpoint? Um, and so I, I kind of thought about it, and I decided, well, yeah, it could. So I have um, one thing I have in my um, examples. Oh, I overrode item theme item list. Hold on a second. Uh, is you can actually get those variables um, as JSON responses. So here I'm loading up node one, two, three, and I have a parameter called like render var. Um, and so I could say render var node dot nid, or uh, in this case it's, um, well, let, let me actually look at a different example. Here's the uh, page template as JSON. So I could say um, sidebar first. Sidebar first dot, you know, do the same thing I did before. Or that's dot nodes <laughs> dot one. So right, there's the, I could look at nodes. I could drill into this uh, using a URL style thing. I have another thing in here where it's, um, yeah, yeah, not bad. Here's, there's also a, um, another Git parameter I add to this where it actually runs the prepare. So, you know, I could actually get the, the prepared things too. This is actually going into the renderable, running the prepare statements. Um, so I think this, this we, we talked about this, like this has implications for like front end templating. Um, these things could be cached, obviously. Um, but this, this would be really useful for um, services that are, that are like trying to alter things on a page. But you, you don't want to write a separate service to do it. The variables are already there. You just want to get at the variables. Um, it, you know, so I, I, think, I think that could be useful. You know, there's uh, an example of this. Um, has anybody ever used um, Mobify? Do people know what that is? It's basically a service that does like a big jQuery parsing of your site and like turns it into like a mobile site. Um, this would be really useful for like a service like that. It's like, actually, no, I'll just, I'll just um, put a parameter as a Git request and get those separately. Um, it may seem silly to go through the whole bootstrap process just to get, like, you know, or um, nodes one. I was making commits to this today, so, well, some, some, things, some things that matter. Um, but the point is, is that these are the kinds of things you can do when you have an API into renderable structure. Um, and that I think I think is is where I'd, I'd like to see this go. Um, so that's kind of the last part that I wanted to show everybody. Um, so I think the to do like today is like and maybe at the sprint and just now is kind of re-engage re-engage discussion. Uh, there are some issues on DLO about like drillables and render API and these kinds of things. But I was kind of I kind of wanted just to work on this kind of to get my concepts fleshed out to see that it was maybe possible. Um, and then from just a code perspective, it's just like proof of concept in, a, in an 8.x uh, sandbox. Um, I actually tried to get that working a little bit. Um, 
In fact, I, I got it loaded. I actually like simlinked, um, simlinked my project, um, and was able to like get it, you know, running. I mean, that's just like PSR four, but you know, it can it can get in there. It's separated out so that it it, it can be added um, as a separate namespace. Um, so anyway. That's about it, I think. So please evaluate the session, node 2618, if you have time. But uh, we can talk about this more. People can have, uh, ask questions if they want. Um, but uh, this, is, this is where I'd like to see it go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. So I like the general direction you're going. Uh, I have one critique and one uh, question. Cool. Early on, you said, and you're describing what you know, a renderable thingy should be. Yes. Um, you presented it as though you were looking at it being for an arbitrary output format. Mm -hmm. That's what render APIs in <coughs> Drupal were intended to do. Right. And I think they failed miserably at that because if you're outputting something in you know, HAL format, you want to use a completely different builder than this in the first place. Right. Um, so I think it's actually better to confine an API like this to, this is an API for building up HTML output. There's different builders and different APIs that deal with HAL or Atom or whatever. Just let those be different builder APIs. Mm -hmm. I think that's a better way to go. So Absolutely. So narrowing this to the intended output is HTML, I think will save us a lot of pain. Absolutely. Um, and then the question, how are you handling um, what Drupal render arrays call attached? So CSS, JavaScript, meta tags, uh, links, caching information, all of this other stuff that makes render arrays currently really, really hard. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're just wrapping objects around the simple stuff, but it's that hard stuff that makes render APIs suck so much to work with. So how would you right. address those kind of things? I'm um, particularly interested in that because I'm dealing with that right now. Yeah, in yeah. That's, that's definitely, <clears throat> I would say that's uh, maybe left off this slide. It's definitely <laughs> a to-do. Um, but I think just in, in a general principle, like doing that in object-oriented code is doing is easier to do that in a big, clunky array. I so, completely agree with that yeah. statement. So I'm I'm not sure. I'd love to talk about it more at this conference. Okay. But like every conference is like kind of like a new a new step here. So I think maybe this is the next step to to think about. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm wondering about what you want that training experience to be like. You talked about how <laughs> a lot right. of a lot of your, your thoughts here are motivated by the difficulty you had training someone to be able to theme in Drupal. And a lot of what you've shown is how the deep internals of Drupal might change mm -hmm. so that the theming experience could be different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what that end goal is exactly or or how will you know that you've succeeded in this refactoring based on how that training could be different or by some other measurement. Totally. Um, I think the less people have to dump things to the screen and dig through them, which mm -hmm. is exactly what we had to do in order to figure out, oh, what does this menu thing look like? Um, the, less we, the less we have to do that and the more we have methods and getters mm -hmm. and an API, um, I think is a, is, a, is a good thing. You know, I would love to say like, oh, call this function to get the things, call this mm -hmm. to do these things. Instead of like, oh, well, I can see that this array is coming from here, and if I, I can tell this is coming from common.inc, and let me go to menu.inc to see how that, oh, that's built this way, you know. Having to do less of that stuff, mm -hmm. I think is a better direction to, to be in. So I, that's kind of vague, but. Okay. Uh, more, more better tools, less pulling things apart, more, sure. more tools. Um, so one process that I, I'm seeing get played out in the movement towards going towards uh, static prototyping or in-browser prototyping is identifying design objects first, which may not use the language of Drupal necessarily. Um, on a project I'm working on right now, the designer has an illustrated list item, which I know will translate to the teaser view of three different node types. Um, but illustrated list item is the thing that he is designing. Um, is is the ultimate goal to make nodes turn into design objects that are a defined thing in a in another template? Um, 
does the fact that it's a node, um, is that the important part, or are you turning a node into something else that is a front-end only concept? I see. Um, I don't think so. I think data should remain data. You know, uh, one thing you'll see, like, in this thing is, like, here's the node. Its mm -hmm. title is still this. The, mm -hmm. the thing that we set in the, um, in the decorator has changed. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, let's, let's leave data as is and mm -hmm. have, you know, this essentially, like, presenter that wraps it, and that's the thing that we're going to pass around. Okay. I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think bit? it does. Okay. The idea that we have the data and we have this separate, we know that something looks like a design and we're inserting the data into the design rather than the other way around. Uh-huh. I think we're in agreement. Yeah, I mean, this this isn't like, yeah. I don't know if this is a new concept, but I think we can like visualize it better when we have ways at getting mm -hmm. at things, you know, mm -hmm. instead of, you know, like when you click on like the Devel Render tab, when you have Devel module installed, and it's that giant gobbledygook, you're not really sure like what's coming from what. Like is it pound items or is it like the zero key that it's talking to? Right. I, you know, I don't actually know, you know, <laughs> uh, and I do Drupal all the time. So getting away from that stuff I think will help like say, oh, I can tell this is data, I don't touch it. Mm -hmm. I can tell these are template variables, I can touch them. There may be different debugging ways to, to get at those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Um, yes. So first off, I am just so impressed by this work. Like, Thank you. This is exactly where I think we have to be going with, with the render layer in, in Drupal. Thank you. So we had a, a Bob this morning talking about headless Drupal. You know, and in the room were a lot of people talking about MVC frameworks using something like Angular or Ember with Drupal doing the data underneath. And a big problem we identified is that as soon as you use Drupal as a data store and just interact with it restfully, you essentially cut out any module's chance to jump in and, and affect that output. If you're putting you know, attributes on the HTML in order to, like data attributes or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we seem to be stuck at the moment in this world where as soon as you want to go into a front end um, world where you're doing your templating, you're essentially losing some of the, the really valuable things in Drupal. So for me, this seems to be mo going in that direction where we can finally associate the data. You probably know a template is producing or is associated with this mm -hmm. display that's going to go with this data? Yeah, it has like, there's a name to the template, whether it's HTML or whatever. Yeah, it and just has can, a name. If we can yeah. get a URI to that, you know, we could start then doing a second request once you get this data back to get a template if you don't have it already mm -hmm. and start um, moving the locus of where this gets processed into the client, but still make it invisible to the, you know, the site developer or the site builder. Right. They're going to go and you know, manipulate a view on their um, node structure page. Uh, and then the front end is going to get that template, that updated template and whatnot. So that's, that's where I really want to see this going. Um, and I'm happy to actually write code to I really would, get there. I would love, yeah, I would love feedback. I mean, a lot of this has been like me hiding in my room and like doing, and not really like participating, because I had this thing where like um, talking about it on Drupal.org, it's like, oh, let's talk about the render array. Let's talk about putting something in the render array to do that, because we want to make, yeah, we, everybody wants progress, but like, mm -hmm. g let, like talking about those design issues, I would, I would love feedback and and to do that here and at the sprint and everything too. So, awesome. yeah, we will then. Yeah. yeah, and thanks again. This is, I know okay. this is a lot of work you've been doing, like for like years now. Well, so. it's mostly like thinking, and <laughs> and writing some stuff and then deleting it all. And so, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello. Um, so, I want to echo that it looks awesome so thanks for doing all that work sure um, <laughs> and uh, yeah I, I like the class uh, decisions that you've made the patterns decisions that you made there um, I also wanted to say like uh, I'm doing uh, with chicks right now we're doing auto escape and yes. auto escape needs Drupal render to actually give us an object because it needs to be a safe twig has a, an idea of a safe markup we're extending that giving uh -huh. us some helpers Yep. And basically, we're passing these safe variables uh, when they are safe, and Drupal render produces that safe variable. So that's something that uh, it's going to be an object. And I also know that there's a couple other might might be better blockers that actually need an object to be coming out of Drupal render. Yeah, that might be something that this can also tie into too, because you yeah, if you could extend from or implement. absolutely. I mean, that's uh, absolutely. I mean, like the domain of object-oriented code is so much richer to do these kinds of things. 
um, than arrays. And I actually did this this morning. Uh, I was going to put it in the talk, but like this is this is a diff between Drupal render in seven and Drupal render in eight. There's a few changes to a few things, but like the overall, you know, it hasn't changed much. And like there are a lot of new ideas that that we have now, especially with just how the entire architecture of core has changed, or we're using Symfony, how we have Twig, and we have objects here and objects there, but we still have this array kind of in the middle. So I think, um, you know, it's only a matter of time. And, and yeah, I think th things like this, uh, you know, we, we don't have the answer to yet, but the answer com becomes visible yeah. once we have the vocabulary of classes. And one implementation comment, I saw you changed, uh, you mentioned that you changed get attribute. That could be troublesome. Uh, sure, if we can absolutely. get it out of there, then that would be awesome. Ab yeah, absolutely, that's the that's the one function that Twig has that actually it implements in the C Twig, and that's what makes Twig fast when you have C on. So okay. either that, or you have to put that upstream. Right. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, I would I would love feedback on what what things should be called. You know, um, I've had a little bit of input on that, but but I'm you know I I'm not married to any of this stuff. You know, I I just want to get like get things moving in this direction, start the conversations, and just see where, see where it heads. If there's another place for that, that would be cool. If not, mm -hmm. we let maybe move your code into Twig. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. You know, I would, uh, like right, right now this is actually agnostic from the theme engine itself. In fact, um, I, I first got it working in PHP template um, before, and syntax looks a little different, but um, I don't know if I have a good example of what I was doing there. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like it is theme engine agnostic. That is basically um, injected, so to speak. I don't know. It's not using what Symphony uses, but but yes, I mean that can be separate. You know. Oh, and too. for the template, you, if you could expose the template so that you could swap the template out, like as a setter getter type thing. Uh huh. Absolutely. That yeah. That would be cool too. Right. I mean, that's that's a protected um, uh, variable now, and that could be you know that could be ex that could Exposing be extended. Uh, we could create a method around that. Um, some sort of registry to validate that exists, those kinds of things. I you know all that's possible, I think. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for your work on this. Sure. Um, it's really cool. I have uh, been doing a lot of Drupal 7 development still and not really paid that close attention to what's happening with 8. Okay. So some of this stuff I'm like, I didn't even realize coming into this that this wasn't going to be about something that is in 8. And then as soon as I saw you doing it, I'm like, why isn't this in 8? Sure. So uh, is that the question? Well, no. Okay. The, okay. Where I'm going with this is I was in the boff with with Jesse about okay. headless Drupal. And yeah, yeah, so yeah. We were talking about you know exposing uh, JSON data structures. Yeah. On the front end for consumption by an Angular setup. Mm -hmm. So uh, seeing that the data structure you had up there with everything uh, for me it's like well that's what I'm building now in seven. Ah. And I'm wondering why, you know, if I'm going to move to eight, why that's not already going to be there? And that was our issue was, you know, she brought it up when she was standing here, was that how do you get, if you want the raw data, you also want to allow modules to decorate it. Mm -hmm. And I love that you were using the, the dec decorator setup because that makes perfect sense. You know, you could have the, the, the raw data, but you could also have the decorated data. And you, you could do what you need with it on the front end. And you add it all inside that structure also of, uh, you know, giving it, you know, what region it lived in. And yeah. you know, that that's all so important for the future of the Internet and Drupal staying relevant to it. Yeah. That this has to make it in as soon as possible. <laughs> this can't wait for nine. Well, we need uh, it in eight one. I, OK, it, it has to be a priority. I think and I, we're going to be right. pushing for it. There's a group of people that are coming together right now. Cool. They're going to be pushing for this so, so type of stuff to become a priority for Drupal because JavaScript MVC is where the internet's going. Sure. And Drupal is such an amazing CMS. We want, I've been doing Drupal for seven years and I, I love it, but I also am really coming to love MVC stuff sure. on JavaScript. So we need this yeah. so that I can keep doing Drupal and I can do Angular and they can work well together. Right. Because Jesse also said she wants it to be three years down the road that Drupal is the CMS of choice for people who want to do JavaScript MVC. Sure. That's where it's going. Right. So let's make it happen. And, and I mean, the, the kind of JSON endpoint kind of stuff, um, you know, this kind of stuff actually doesn't even invoke theme engine at all. Like, the builders are built, it creates the renderables, but it doesn't touch, it doesn't touch any other stuff. Whereas, so it's super fast. 
Well, I, I think so. That's another thing. I need tests it, and well, benchmarking. If you guys be. want to do tests, I'm, I would right. love that. But, but yeah. then having the, de the decorators in there, so you could, you know, on an endpoint, you could say, do I want to supply the decorators or not? You know, being able to have that configuration. Yeah, right. You know, there, all that stuff is so crucial to where we're going. Yeah. That I, I, yeah, I love this. Right. So let's I, do it. I, I would love I think Yes, thank you. Is there a working group for this yet? Are you go no, there? there's me. <laughs> so thank thank you for I mean thank you for coming. Yeah, this is yeah we're the yeah we're create yeah there was let's, a, let's the, talk in the boff there was a talk of creating a group uh, for talking about how to make keep Drupal relevant to the whole MVC movement for JavaScript. So yeah, you know, maybe we can talk after this. About well, absolutely, and, and I mean this this kind of fell out of now that we have an API, what can we do? And this this fell out of that. You know, um, this was not like my primary goal. Uh, this was kind of like a nice to have. It was like, oh yeah, sure, I can write something like that. You know, Silox can do. You know, um, but it has it has implications like this. It has implications yeah. for front end templating. It has so implications was the thing for was services. It's like you know the the default understanding with Drupal is I'm going to be creating HTML. Right? Mm -hmm. I need to create HTML. Mm -hmm. But where things are going, Drupal doesn't necessarily need to make that its priority. Right. What Drupal needs to be really good at is providing excellent, rich data structures. Yep. To a front end framework, yep. to tell it what it needs to do with it. Yeah, you know, say, uh, you know, here's what the content creator intended this content to do, and if the front end is written to understand that language, it will do what it needs to with it based on the platform it's on. Because right. the platforms are all changing. We've got so many different types of devices, and your data is not just going to go live on a desktop. So, mm -hmm. this needs to provide the information the front end needs to do the right. Thing with the content. Yeah, and I mean, Twig templates can be used on the front end as, as well. So there's a lot of overlap well, there. What you're writing in Twig is basically what we write in Angular. Exactly. It's the same. It's it's, exactly it's very similar. Part. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the curly brackets, everything. It's right. Just, you know, the object oriented. Yeah. So. Cool. I'm excited. Great. Well, let's we'll talk more. People who were in that boff, um, let's chat <laughs> in a few minutes, and we'll talk Sorry, about next right. steps. So no, no problem. Yeah. Thank you. I'd also like to echo that this is awesome. Cool. Uh, I was wondering from like a, a themer experience perspective, um, if making more data available to Twig uh, could have some separation of concerns types issues, or if there's if there's anything along those lines that, uh, uh, you know, I've I've seen people do some really fun things in themes like back in five in the days of five and six. So I was just wondering if that was a a, a concern. In, uh, Meaning, be addressed. Um, I, I'm just going to repeat the question. I make sure I understand it. You're asking, like, um, I mean, a lot of these examples, I'm passing very simple things as arguments. You're saying, like, how do how do we get it more, or or just making sure that somebody doesn't put, you know, Node 45 title in, you know, field something else. Or, sure. Or just like, so the separation concerns in the themes. Themselves. Right. I mean, um, that, that's, I think, two points to that. Um, Twig templates are compiled, so there's this, there's some protection there, just make, making sure that people aren't doing bad things. That was one of the points of the Twig initiative anyway. Um, the other point, too, is, is that, you know, compared to arrays, this is definitely, like, we can do those types of things. We can do those types of checks. We have, um, you know, we can make sure that the types of the arguments are what we expect, um, that getters are finding things that they want to get, you know. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to be perfect. Obviously, we, there's a lot of figuring out to do, but it's definitely going to be better than digging through an array. Sure. You know, I think, I think that's, that's kind of the point, is, like, methods, we need methods to get at things. Yeah, we need an API. Thank you. Sure. So in answer to your question about how we actually make this happen, I have a proposal for that. Drupal 8 already out of the box. Uh, the raw entities, you can serve those as JSON with HAL, with uh, you know RESTful links on them. You can do that now. If you want something that's basically that plus um, <clears throat> you know, the, the pre-process, essentially, you can hit, you can very easily set it up to hit uh, you know, node slash whatever ID with a different mind type, which will just build an, a render array object, turn that into a JSON string, and print that. That support for doing that is already in core. You just have to write it. The actual engine of this doesn't belong in Drupal. This belongs as its own standalone MIT licensed library on packages that we could just pull in like everything Absolutely. else. Absolutely. Yep. 
and then just the glue code to take you know, any entity, run it through render object, and then serialize the render object, that should be pretty straightforward to do. Maybe, maybe not use the REST module, but the routing system is absolutely capable of serving these kind of objects up serialized today. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, I think that there's uh, serving um, business objects mm -hmm. can happen. Serving kind of abstracted structure in this kind of way, I don't, I don't know if that is there really, but it, it could be written probably. But well, the question to ask is why are these different than a business object? Uh, well, they're they're kind of like abstracted, like um, you know, this is. This is at like abstracted structure. I guess you know if, if we think of pages as business objects themselves, mm -hmm. then then we could. Um, so where you know. where core is moving, and this is something I want to talk to you about in more detail afterward, is we're trying to push in this HTML fragment right. object. I, I was looking at that thing the other day, which, mostly because I was lost, because <laughs> well, I don't I, really understand Symphony that well. So that's not a Symphony thing at all. Oh, well, um, it, case in point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. You know, I'm trying to get anything coming out of Drupal with render arrays to collapse down to those. If we can merge these concepts, then there's your business, your your domain object, that is, you know, whatever data in render render ready form, mm -hmm. and then serializing that to an HTML string via Twig, or serializing that to JSON to print out on a different MIME type at the same URI. That's easy. Sure. So as long as we can approach that in the right way. I think gluing this kind of thing into Drupal, as long as we're able to discipline ourselves about how we're using it, I think that's actually pretty straightforward. Okay. We just need to make sure that we're disciplined about how we do that. Yeah. But there's, I think, a lot of potential to do this, even as a contrib module to do this. Sure. And I think, um, you know, there's kind of the services aspect, and then there's like that the, the kind of twig where are my variables mm -hmm. aspect. And the twig where are my variables thing, that's that's a harder problem to fix. This is this is a little easier to fix. Yeah. But this fell out. It really just did. I wrote the code to do this in like a few hours. It fell out of all the other stuff that I was doing, you know. So there's definitely cr overlap happening. There. And that's where proper domain object modeling is helpful. Yes, Things fall out like definitely. that. Definitely. <laughs> um, and and with regard to what you said about y this should be a separate component from Drupal. Yeah, I mean, all all the namespacing in here is is completely independent. Um, I wrote something called like render manager interface that um, can basically is set to be fake Drupal. So that's dependency injected. It has like, you know, it has an altar. It has a decorator things. The, the altar is like if you want to switch out the class that the builder is using. So like bit builder says theme node, but you want to switch it to something else. I actually had an example of that in my like fake module. Um, but yeah, but it, it was it was it was my idea to have this thing be standalone component. This GitHub project will probably I'll probably just extract a submodule out of this on GitHub and then turn all this stuff into like a demo uh, that'll be a sandbox for Drupal. And then this is just going to be the only thing that's going to be on GitHub are basically these these files here um, as that can be used in any PHP framework. Yes, I think we have about five minutes. Okay, I'll so. I'll try to keep this one. No, short. no, no worries. Yeah. Um, so the one thing that I'm struggling with um, currently is I, from a theming point of view, I like accessing my variables like this. I, I like accessing my my uh, variables and drillability inside of my templates. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I do that, I screw over the field UI. I because field UI doesn't know that I just ripped out a field from from the the non the node yes. content and yes. and that I put it into a different div over here or over there, and so all of a sudden it's like my template has just screwed over any site builder that needs to move the fields around with weights inside of the field UI. Um, right. Is, uh, like, fundamentally, I think that control should be at the template level, but, of course, I can't just make that decision and say Drupal can have it. <laughs> That's the way this is going right. to be. Um, is there something that we can maybe do to kind of bridge that gap? Right. Um, so the question, uh, this is maybe... Maybe I'm going to say the answer that Larry's going to say, but um, there's this idea that exists in the far future of Drupal where uh, because Twig is compiled, we can inspect templates for the things that are in the templates at compile time and actually talk back to Drupal to say, like, this is never rendered, so skip processing that has to do with this. An example is, like, site name variable. If you're not printing out site name variable, 
in your page template, remove it from remove it from your theme configuration page. Like take out like uh, modify the form. Uh, that's that's like fantasy land, but because Twig is compiled and we have things we have like things like reflection, we can discover things about what the templates are. You know, we're not we're not so naive about those things. So I think that's that's an aspect there too. Um, one thing I don't have in here is the whole like hide, render, show, printed kind of stuff. That's not built in yet. That's a very Drupalism kind of thing. Oh, yeah, right. Well, it's the without yeah. thing, right? But that concept I I didn't do yet. You know, so that but that's another that's a good question. Um, and I think at, you know at some level like sites are sites will be sites, and like <laughs> we're never gonna like there's gonna be inconsistent things in the UI that's like oh well we don't print this because of these reasons like. You know, I, I would I would love to do some work on that too, but um, that's that's I think a very hard problem to solve. You know, yeah, yes, sir. That wasn't what I was going to suggest. Okay, all, actually. all right, well, go that's ahead. That's a good idea too. Okay, but if currently uh, fields use theme functions <coughs> or formatters, formatters, are right? Wonky arrays. Yeah. Um, actually, and formatters are now objects. But if you can associate a field instead with a renderable object, that renderable object can very easily have methods on it that say, hey, this thing is or is not configurable. If you're overriding a given renderable object, subclass it, wire that to get used instead, and then right. that's something that the field UI could, could examine talk the to. object and say, hey, yes. is this thing configurable or not? If this you know, particular subclass has changed that method to say no, then can hide that part of the exactly. field UI. Exactly, right. Objects give you options. It, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 a great idea too. A simpler idea, um, but yeah, I mean that that like subclass the 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 thing, put some information about there about what should disappear in the UI, and now we just have, we have a way to do it now. You know. Yeah, that's kind of magic land, but we we could we could potentially do it. All right, I think that's about time. If you have more questions, I'll be around uh, today. I actually have to jump on a call in about 15 minutes. Um, please pick up your trash. Um, they told me to ask you that. Take the survey. This is Node 20, 2618. Uh, take the survey and enjoy Austin. Thank you for coming.